Welcome to the Door Roller Money Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Berger. Today in episode 329, uh, we're going to talk about, I guess, the only thing there is to talk about right now in the world, and that is COVID-19. And I guess for this podcast, how it affects our finances, specifically our investing. Uh, this is the first podcast I've recorded since, I guess, all of the craziness happened. And um, I've, I've recorded a number of YouTube videos. And if you're part of the Door Roller Facebook group, and you can find it at doorroller.net forward slash Facebook uh, group, you'll I post them there. I post them on uh, my, the Rob Berger Facebook page. They're, of course, on my YouTube channel. So I've done a lot of videos about the stimulus package, now called the CARES Act, which passed a few days ago, and its impact on mortgage relief, its impact on student loan relief, its impact on the stimulus checks that most people will be, be receiving, uh, its impact on our retirement investing, uh, it waives RMDs for this year. Uh, it makes accessing your, your funds easier uh, and without penalty in certain circumstances. Today, I want to do something different. As I said, my first podcast since really COVID-19 became the really life-changing issue that it is. I want to talk about sort of my views of investing, the stock market, and the future. For longtime listeners, you know that I, I brag about my inability to predict anything. Um, as I've mentioned, and this I'm serious, although I repeat it many times, I literally thought interest rates would rise from their historic lows in 2010. <laughs> the Fed's at 0%. So, you know, when it comes to predicting what's going to happen in the next five minutes, you should not listen to me. But maybe, I don't know, you'll, you'll humor me at least for the next few minutes in this podcast, because I do want to kind of predict a little bit, if you will. So let's first kind of figure out where we've been. And today is March 30th. I'm hoping this gets published very soon afterward, but I'm recording it on March 30th. Actually, if you knew nothing about the events of the past weeks and months, and you just looked at the stock market, oh, today's not bad. S&P is up 3.35% uh, for the day. The market's closed now. It's after four. Dow is up over 3%. My own Apple was up almost 3%. Although if, 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 if I'd been asleep for the last few months and I looked at the, the closing price of Apple at 254, I would say, wait a minute, wasn't it trading at like 320? So what has happened? Just let's start with sort of the facts. If we look at the market, and I, I like to use the Apple um, stock market app, stock app. And uh, so if we go back a month, even three months, you know, it was up to around 3370 S&P 500. And it's now down at 2600, 2626 closed. No, no, 26, yeah, 2626 it closed today. So as you know, certainly know by now, we, we, we declined by more than 20%, which is the official definition of a bear market, our first one since 09. And um, my question to you is, have you sold out? It's interesting in the Facebook group, some people come on and say, yeah, they went to cash. And some timed it pretty well, uh, by all accounts. Uh, I haven't sold a thing, literally. I, I probably should have, not to change my asset allocation, but just to move from one stock index fund to a, another one for tax purposes, to lock in some losses. Go from a, say, a, you got to watch out for the wash sale rule, but maybe going from a total stock market index fund at Vanguard to, say, an S&P 500, for example. But, but I haven't even done that. I've literally sold nothing. And I talk to folks who have sold a lot. Uh, as I mentioned, some people in the Facebook group have sold out, and, and that sparks all kinds of discussions. It was interesting. One person said I, she'd sold out, and she wanted to know if it was time to get back in. This was like a week ago. And I come in, and I said, yeah, that's kind of the problem, ain't it? <laughs> Even if you get lucky, and let's be honest, that's all it is, sheer luck, and you time it perfectly, and you get out right before the bottom falls out, how do you know when to get back in? And if you're a long-term investor, I think most of us are, you've got to get it right twice, you know, when you get out and then when you get back in and you have to do it over and over and over and over and over again for decades of investing. And you just can't do it. I've never met anyone that can do it. I've met plenty of people who think they can do it, but I've never met anyone that actually can do it. And so I go the opposite extreme and I just stick to my, my investing uh, allocation. You know, it's interesting. I don't, I don't know who wrote this. I think it, it may have been in the New York Times, but one of the reporters had said, you know, 
he'd been a long time buy and hold investor for 40 years and had stuck to, through it stuck through it thick and thin and you know good times and bad times including the last bear market in 0809 and but he lost it here he just couldn't take it and i'm thinking really i mean yeah this is unprecedented times in in the world that we're living in but in terms of the stock market i mean this is this is not horrible i mean 08 and 09 was much worse now this could get that bad right this, i'll get to my predictions in a minute but i mean we lost over 50 percent uh in 08 and 09. I think it ended in March 9th or 10th, I think, of 09 when we hit bottom. Of course, we didn't know we hit bottom then. Everyone was still scared to death. Uh, but this one's not nearly as bad. I mean, this is nothing. This got in, this, this interrupted a 40-year streak of solid buy and hold investing. Really? Well, I get that it's scary times and no one likes to watch their portfolio fall. And for me personally, this has actually been harder than any of the previous bear markets that I've lived through um, as an investor. But the reason is because of the amount that I have invested, right? I've, I, I have accumulated more than I had in 08, 09, and a lot more than I had in 2000, 2001 through 9-11. And so uh, when I look at my numbers, I mean, they're ugly. I mean, the paper loss is like, holy cow. Brutal. I won't even tell you because, you know, my mother-in-law could be listening to the show, but it's a big, ginormous, hairy, ugly number. That's what I'm going to tell you. And there's part of me, I'll tell you my reaction to it. It's like, okay, Rob, you're 53. Now we all know any of us can get hit by a truck tomorrow. I guess that's even more obvious today than normal. But let's just say I live to be 95, right? Um, uh, I've got a long time to invest, a really long time. And um, I look at that number, that loss. I log into personal capital. I log into eMoney Advisor. And I see the, 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 the negative number of, of my declining net worth. So it shows me by month and by year on eMoney Advisor. And as I told you, it's an ugly, uh, ugly number. But I think to myself, I need to really feel the emotion of that number. I need, to, I need to recognize that it hurts to look at that. It's scary to look at that. And then I need to just suck it up. And if I can do that, I'm stronger through this. I'll be a better investor. I'll be a stronger investor uh, when I come out of, when we all come out of this, which we will. I, that I absolutely predict. <laughs> I don't know when, by the way, but absolutely we will. It'll make me a stronger investor. So some pe people say, don't look at your investments when it's going down. And I think that if that works for you, keep doing it. That's great. And there are certainly days when I don't look, but there are plenty of days that I do knowing that it's bad. When we were down almost 10%, I don't know, a week and a half ago or whatever it was in one day, I knew that just that one day would be huge. I mean, I lost more in, in that one day than I had probably accumulated in the first 10 years of investing. I say loss, I should put it, I should put that in air quotes, it's just paper at this point. But I, I looked on purpose, I wanted to see it and I wanted to feel it. Uh, I don't think I told my wife that day, uh, eh, she didn't need to know. I tell her every now and again, she tells me not to tell her. But I think it's important that we recognize that this is part of the bargain. If we're gonna be investors, if we're gonna be buy and hold long-term investors, this is part of the deal. The funny thing is I started this podcast in 2013, actually Veterans Day. And we, this is really the first bad market. We had a couple corrections, right? End of, end of 18 and beginning of 2018 as well. But I mean, nothing obviously like a bear market, nothing like this. And so I've been telling you guys, you know, the day's coming. I don't know when, and I don't know what's gonna trigger it. I kind of assumed it would be rising interest rates. Once again, <laughs> shows you how good I am at predicting. Um, but I knew it was, it was, it was going to come eventually. I didn't know when. And so it's like, great, it's here. I was kind of excited. It's like, now we have something to talk about on the show because we've been talking about how to deal with this. Now we actually get to live it. I kind of got excited. I know as I say that it's pathetic. Maybe I should rewind and cut that out of the show, but I'm not gonna. Um, so uh, that's what, what I've done, which is basically nothing. Now I've got friends that, I mean, they're selling, they've got trailing stop losses that get triggered and they're optioning this and they got puts and calls and, uh, a good friend of mine I may have on the show down the road, I don't know, uh, named Joe. And um, I give him a hard time about his investing strategy. By the way, he gives me a hard time about mine. And uh, he's all into options and all that sort of thing. Okay, that's his, that's his thing, not mine. Uh, 
But, you know, now we've got something to talk about. Now we've got to all of the things that we've talked about on the show, goodness, for the last, what, seven years. Now we can put them into practice. One of the things that I've said repeatedly is that when the stock market tanks, it's, it's almost the least of our concern. I mean, it's a concern, but there's always something going on in the world that's scary, that makes the decline in the stock market even more, more hard to handle. Obviously, COVID-19 and the health issues and the business issues, what we're experiencing now. In 08 and 09, it was what we thought what might be the collapse of the banking industry, the collapse of the auto industry. And uh, you know, if we go back to 2000, 2001, you had the tech bubble burst, which was um, certainly uh, plenty of asset bubbles have burst in the past, but certainly that was unique in some ways. And then we had 9-11, obviously, uh, 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 a very difficult time. So what's normal and predictable is that something real scary is going on in the world that causes this. What's not predictable and what's not normal is the, the actual thing, whatever it happens to be. This time it's a global pandemic. Next time, I don't know if that's five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever, uh, you know, it'll be something else and we, we can't predict it. But it makes dealing with our investments all the more difficult because many of you, some of you are already out of work. Some of you are either concerned you're going to be out of work or maybe you own a business and you, you have no business anymore, at least no paying customers, possibly. My sister is a painting contractor. She owns a, a painting company in Ohio, does commercial and residential work. She's kept some of her commercial jobs, all the residential jobs that have gone. Um, they all canceled, even the ones that were outdoors. Uh, and I get that, but you know, uh, it's had a big impact on her business. Uh, and so people are, are rightfully uh, afraid. Now, I don't have answers to all of that. <laughs> I'm sorry, if you were tuning in for me to solve all of this. You're gonna be gravely disappointed. I don't have answers for all of that, but I do want to talk about it in the sense of how we respond as investors, because um, there have been some things that people tend to say that I actually think are kind of dangerous. The, one of them is this is a buying opportunity. I hear that a lot. This is a buying opportunity. Um, and I, I think that's dangerous. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, and um, so that's that's one thing. Um, and then the other one is sort of, and maybe it's kind of related, but kind of people think the worst is over. Not not that that, that the market's going to just go sky high now, but you know we had those sort of gut wrenching days where we're down ten percent, up ten percent, down ten percent. You know we still have, we've still since then had some significant days. Today we're up over three percent, but things at least relative to where we've been over the last month, they seem to have calmed down a little bit. At least we're not shocked anymore. We, we, we're kind of, we've been involved in this in the U.S. I mean, I'm in Virginia. We just got the governor's order. We have to uh, stay at home till June 10th. So, you know, today's March 30th anyway. But, but the shock of it's kind of over. I mean, not completely, but it's not the same as it was two weeks ago. Um, and so there's this sense that, okay, well, we got through that. It was bad, but the market seems to kind of stabilized. And um, I actually don't see it that way. Uh, I don't, I'm not predicting a 10% drop tomorrow or that will decline more, but I don't see this as a buying opportunity, at least for most people, and I'm gonna explain why. And I don't think the worst is over. I don't even think it's close. I think we've got a, a, a lot more in store economically, uh, and, and much of which we can't predict. I know this is gonna like, I'm just cheering everyone up today. I actually am quite hopeful, oddly enough, uh, and, and confident of our future. It's just that I don't think, you know, it's going to be all sunny days ahead now that we sort of live through the first sort of initial stock market shock. So let me break it down. Um, why don't I think this is a buying opportunity for most people? Well, first of all, I, I generally tend to be a buy and hold investor, right? So I have an asset allocation. It's 70-30. Uh, I'm 53. Don't, don't pretend that's the right asset allocation, but I think it's a perfectly reasonable one. And that's my allocation. So I don't have money to go to, to go buy. I don't see this as a buying opportunity. Uh, I could, I suppose, and change my asset allocation, right? Take some of my cash and short-term bonds maybe and buy into stocks. I'm not going to. Why would I change my asset allocation? I, I don't change it when the market is going sky high. I don't change it when it's dropped. I don't 
you know, it's 70, 30. I'm not going to try to time the market. So in that sense, I absolutely don't think it's a buying opportunity. The other thing is, is that if you look at valuation metrics, say PE, for example, which seems to be a common one, and we can all even pull up uh, Case Schiller. I looked at it earlier today. He does a 10 year sort of um, inflation adjusted a, sort of average PE. And I, uh, I think I may have said Case Schiller, that's the home one, but Schiller, the Schiller PE. Uh, it's like 26. Let me see what it is today. 20, oh no, excuse me, 24.79. The mean is 16.7. It's eight points above the mean. That's not cheap. Now, one could argue that given interest rates, it might be reasonably priced. Maybe there's some truth to that as interest rates go down, asset values go up. That's true whether you're talking about uh, stocks, uh, uh, real estate, any asset. But still, 24.7 is just under 25. That ain't, that's not cheap. Um, so the market as a whole, and by the way, the, the regular PE, if you will, is almost 20 uh, with, with a mean of under 16. So I don't see the stock market as cheap. Uh, I don't see any reason at this point to change my asset allocation because this is a buying opportunity. That's my view. And I don't think it's shared by many people. Everyone seems to be thinking this is a buying opportunity. I think the problem is, is that we're too close to when the market was a lot higher. And we say, well, I mean, it was whatever, 20% higher than it is now. It dropped, it stabilized, so it can go back up. Well, sure, it can. It can also go back, it can go down further. But if we just forget market fluctuations for a moment, just look at valuations, this is not a cheap market still. Um, so yeah, I don't see this as a, a buying opportunity. Now, I will say this. Um, I do think there are certain investments, if you're, if you're buying individual companies, that could be a buying opportunity. I personally think long-term investors do, would do quite well in banking right now. And I own Citibank and uh, US Bank as a full disclosure, and they've just tumbled. I mean, goodness. It's been brutal and I haven't sold a thing and I think they're good long-term investments and um, I may sell them to lock in the losses, which I, I do have losses on those investments, and then just buy two other banks, buy Chase and Wells Fargo or something. Uh, haven't decided yet. Uh, so far, I haven't done anything. But again, I won't get out of banks. I'll just change the investment. But I think there are some industries where you know they're on solid footing uh, and they've got good balance sheets. And by historical standards, they're rel relatively inexpensive. But apart from that, yeah, I don't think this is a buying opportunity. I think this is a stick to your plan opportunity, which is probably me 99% of the time. Stocks would have to get really cheap for me to think I ought to change my asset allocation. I guess I wouldn't rule it out. But yeah, it's kind of hard for me to imagine that. Um, so now that's that. But what about sort of the future? Where do we go from here? I think we're in for a very, very difficult time. I think we'll overcome it. I think we'll meet the challenge. But I don't think it's going to be easy. And I don't think we're anywhere near knowing just how difficult it's going to be. And uh, so uh, and let me tell you why. So first of all, as we all know, uh, many businesses are either closed or all but closed from small businesses uh, to large businesses. I mean, you know, things like Apple's stores are all closed. Um, obviously, the airline industry has been brutalized, um, travel industry, industry generally, uh, and that's not going to change overnight. I mean, they're in, they're in that situation for months at a minimum. And this isn't money they can make up. This is gone, right? I mean, this is, if you think about uh, our country, any country, and you think about productivity, um, our productivity is, and, and GDP, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grind to a halt when we start seeing numbers reported. And you don't make that up. Now, I think once we get out of this, you know, business will, will start up again and we'll get going and we'll get moving, but, but we, won't, we won't regain what we lost. What we've lost, we've lost. And many small businesses are closed. Obviously, you know, retail has been hammered. Um, restaurants have been hammered. Uh, you know, they're, they're all effectively closed. They're doing delivery and, and, and carry out um, to maybe offset some, but that's still hammering uh, uh, that industry. And, you know, this is going to be for at least, I think, again, remember how bad I am at predicting, but I mean, if I, Virginia's closed until June 10th. So I think it's fair to say we're looking at months. Uh, and, and beyond that, I guess no one knows. Um, and so uh, you might say, well, Rob, that's just, you're just all Mr. Cheery today and full of good news. How can you be hopeful? Well, I'm hopeful 
because our country and our and our and the world, but in our country, we've been through a lot. It's 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 easy to to downplay the things we've been through in the past, and the things that we've worked through. They they they, they never seem quite as bad in hindsight many 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 years later i mean for most of us world war ii is something we learned in school we didn't live through it obviously some did but most of us didn't i didn't um and uh and that was a brutal time i mean you go back further to world war one the great depression lasted for over a decade you know and then the market in the in the you know everyone sort of focuses on the 29 crash but the market in what 37 38 39 it was brutal um, you know, and of course we had 08, 09, which by the way, frankly, in comparison, seems like a walk in the park, but, uh, you know, we're more than a decade removed from it. I mean, people were scared to death and it had sort of a, I think a, a life changing effect on the younger generation as they, you know, as it just decimated our economy for a period of time, but we worked through it. And I think we'll work through this. I just don't think it's going to be easy and I don't think it's going to be quick. And so right now, we don't really know the financial impact. I mean, a lot of people are predicting it, but we don't really know. And we'll know over time. We'll know as companies start to, to report quarterly numbers, and they're going to be ugly. They're going to, I mean, there's going to be mind-boggling ugly. Um, we'll know it as more and more government numbers um, uh, get published, GDP and all of that. We saw unemployment was over 3 million uh, claims, um, I think it was on Friday. I mean, that, that number is just, you know, it's hard to even comprehend that number. So we're going to have a real shock to the system. And it's not going to, so that's number one. Two, it's not going to be over quickly, but it will be over. I mean, it, we will get through this. And when we do, we will get back to work. And when we do, um, over, you know, over time, things will get back to quote unquote normal. And by that, I mean everything from our day to day lives to a business, to the stock market. It's just, I don't think it's going to happen overnight. And I think it's important to have that, you know, that expectation. I, I like to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. And so, um, you know, while I hope for the best, I want to be, I don't want to have my, I don't want to set my expectations to a point where uh, I'm, I'm pummeled when things don't work out as, as, as well as I'd hoped. And so, I, yeah, I think we're in for a difficult time um, over certainly the next months and probably a year. And, and I think, I'll make another prediction. You know, the Great Depression influenced a generation. Of course, I'm not old enough, obviously. Um, and my mom did not live in, the, she was born shortly after the, the Great Depression ended. She was uh, born, born during World War II. Um, but my grandmother lived through the Great Depression. And it influenced her and her generation. I think in many ways, in positive ways. You know, when I talk about the latte factor, as I have in the past, I get different reactions. And some people, maybe not now, <laughs> but in the past, it was like, oh, I'm not going to give up my latte. Life is too short. Now, of course, everyone's like, I can't drink a latte. Uh, you can't even go to a Starbucks. Uh, it's funny how our perspectives can change. But my grandmother, who paid cash for her home, uh, saved diligently out of every paycheck, uh, was not wealthy by any, uh, you know, by any measure. She was a, a nurse, um, but not, not wealthy by any measure, but saved for her retirement and retired at a traditional age and, 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 and did well for herself under those circumstances. She came out of the depression and that's what she lived through as a child. And it influenced her attitude towards money. And I think to some extent, not nearly as much, it influenced the children of, of, of the folks that lived through the Great Depression. By the time it got to me, the Great Depression was like something you read about in history, history books. You know, it, it wasn't, you didn't feel it. I think what we're going to go through, what we're going through now, and what we're going to go through in the months and even years to come, will, will, will affect, will have a generational effect. You know, we, in big ways and small ways. You know, in the past, we've talked about a, um, an emergency fund. That's pretty simple, straightforward. Everyone knows what that is. It's not complicated like the stock market or, or puts or calls or GDP. And in the past, you know, I think we, we, we know that we need an emergency fund. How much? Oh, three to six months. Or, you know, if you have the Dave Ramsey. I mean, I don't know what Dave Ramsey's doing now. He's probably still sticking to his $1,000. Uh, that's not looking so strong right now. But 
you start to see an emergency fund, regardless of where you are financially right now, in a totally different way now. You realize what is possible. What We're living through a black swan event, right? And it puts things as, as mon I'll call it mundane or simple as an emergency fund in a totally different light. You know, it, it, we're no longer thinking about getting that, you know, that, that extra nice car that might cost some more money, but we can afford the monthly payment, right? We're kind of in survival mode, I would say. I think most of us, we should be. If you're not, you should be. Um, and, and it's okay to be in survival mode. That's just what life requires sometimes, right? Um, and... But I do. I think it will have a, a generational effect where we see money, we see resources, and we see our lives differently. I think, obviously, 9-11 had that kind of impact um, for different reasons, of course. I think to some extent, 08 and 09 had that kind of impact, but I think this one is going to be much more profound. And in the end, I think that's probably good. I don't see that as a bad thing. Uh, but I do see it as a major impact on how people see and, and, and think about money and careers and jobs. I mean, you know, you go to the grocery store today and people are wearing gloves and masks and, you know, there's not as much food on the shelves as we're used to. And you're like, wow, you know, before I just got in my car and drove down here, I could buy whatever I wanted. Now, half the shelves are empty. It's like, ah, I guess I shouldn't take that for granted. And by the way, uh, thank you, men and women who show up every day and work at the grocery stores because, we, you know, we couldn't live without you. And boy, I guess we don't take them for granted anymore. Before, we probably just didn't give them much thought. It was just life. So, yeah, I think it's going to have a generational effect on our attitudes towards money and towards careers and towards living. And I think that's probably a good thing. So, I don't hope this doesn't come off as negative. I don't really view my attitudes towards what we're going through as negative at all. And I'm incredibly optimistic about our future. I think we've got a tough row to hoe ahead of us. I mean, you know, we've got some work ahead of us, but I'm incredibly optimistic. So I tell you all of that to go come back to the stock market. When people say, is this a buying opportunity? I want to say, are you kidding me? If anything, we don't know what this is. But if you think it's a buying opportunity, that tells me you think we've kind of cleared the, the hurdle. We've, we've gotten past the problem. And we haven't even, in many cases, we haven't even gotten to the problem yet. I mean, in Virginia, it, things are going to get much worse in terms of the health issues before they get better. So no, this really isn't a buying opportunity. I think this is a stick to your investment plan opportunity, um, absolutely scrub your finances. Uh, you know, I talk about the money audit. I've talked about it on the show. I talk about it in my book, Retire Before Mom and Dad. You absolutely should be going through the money audit. You scrub every expense that you have and you get rid of what you don't need, right? If you're not going to work anymore and you've got a car or two or three parked, call your car insurance company. See if you can get the, the premiums changed, reduced, whatever. Um, we should be doing those things to preserve cash. I think those are just smart things to do to protect ourselves and our families. And so, yeah, this is not a buying opportunity, but it's also not a selling opportunity. I think that would be a grave mistake because I have no doubt that we'll get through this. We'll get back to work. The economy, economy both here in the U.S. and globally, will get back on track. Um, and um, the market, you know, it's funny. And I'll just, I'll close with this. I don't even know how long my, my little soapbox is gone today. Oh, only 29 minutes. Oh, yeah, goodness, that's nothing. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, uh, with the stock market and all of that, you know, when I hear people talk about it being a buying opportunity, um, yeah, I just, it's just not. It's, um, but it's not a selling opportunity either. It's a stick to your plan opportunity. And I hope that's what you've done. And, um, yeah, I guess that's what I have to say today. I am uh, going to be, of course, doing more podcasts and maybe talking about more specific issues uh, that we're going through and things that might help you plan. You know, it's funny, the not funny, ha ha, but the whole blue binder, which I've talked about in the past, uh, it, it kind of has taken on new significance, huh? So I'm actually going to be breaking mine out and updating it and making sure it's accurate. And for those of you who don't, don't know what that is, you can Google it. I don't know if you Google 
Door roller blue binder. Does it come up? I don't even know. Let's see. Oh yeah, the money binder. Yeah, just Google the money binder. Um, how to prepare your finances for, let's, let's see if I can get this thing on. Oh, for your death. Huh, that's pretty blunt. Um, it's funny, it says it's written by DR and it's got my picture. I used to go by DR when I first started blogging. People thought I was a doctor. Anyway, uh, it's basically a binder that you can put everything in it that someone would need if the person who manages the finances in your family. I used to say got hit by a truck. I think I'm gonna stick with that because I don't wanna come up with other ways that people can die. Um, and you know, in my case, I handle the finances, I handle the investing. My wife you know, is not really into that kind of thing. So I've put together a binder so that if I do get hit by a truck, she and or our children can break out the binder and know what we've got. I've got letters in there that explain my investing philosophy. And um, I think now is a good time to make sure you've got one of those. If uh, you're the one in your family responsible for your money. I think any time is a good time, but now is definitely a good time. So uh, that's what I have to say on, on, the, on the topic of COVID-19 and our market and our business world and the impact it's having on our lives. Uh, certainly we'll be talking about it more in the days and weeks to come, both in this podcast and in, on my YouTube channel. Um, by the way, lots of relief in the CARES Act to go far beyond the $1,200 stimulus check that everyone talks about. I mean, that's really, I mean, that's important. And I know it'll help a lot of people, but that's just, I mean, you, you, you can, if you have a federally backed mortgage, you can stop paying your mortgage for up to a year. Now, there are things you have to do, but if, if you've been uh, financially affected by COVID-19, directly or indirectly, all you have to do is certify that that's the case. If you have a federally backed mortgage, you get 180 day forbearance. And within that 180 days, you can apply to extend it for another 180. There's no investigation. There's no one there to approve or disapprove your application or to interview you or quiz you about whether, you know, your level of impact is sufficient enough. You just certify that you've been directly or indirectly affected financially by COVID-19. Done. Uh, federally backed student loans, the forbearance, you know, of course, there's no interest at the moment that uh, was done earlier. But under the CARES Act, it's, there's an auto, it kicks in automatically. No payments, a forbearance. So um, uh, there's obviously a lot of small business help. They, um, they've extended unemployment by 13 weeks. So most states are, I think, what, 26 weeks, I think. Federal government's extended it by 13, which gets it out to the end of the year. Plus they've added $600 a week for, I think it's four months, if I've got that right. Um, so a lot of help in the CARES Act. Uh, and so if, if that it can be of help to you, make sure you, you dig into that and figure out what's available to you. Um, I can tell you on the mortgage relief front, to get that process started, just call your mortgage servicer. That's what you do, the, the company that you pay your mortgage to each, each month. Um, so, and by the way, the other thing, they, they've, they've really thought about a lot in this. It's amazing to me they can put this statute together so quickly. It's almost 900 pages long. It won't hurt your credit score. That's actually part of the, the statute that um, uh, non-payment because of a forbearance thing, like whether it's student loans um, or, or mortgages, will not hurt your credit. So um, definitely, you should take advantage of those things if you're eligible. And even if you can pay your mortgage, but you've still been impacted financially by COVID-19, I would still consider forbearance and then take that payment you would have made. Maybe you're still working, uh, but you've had other impacts and save it, right? I mean, I think cash is king right now. Um, and so if you, can, if you can save more money, I don't see why you don't do it. Anyway, I've probably gone on long enough in this episode, but it's been on my mind. I wanted to share it with you. Incredibly optimistic. But we've got some difficult days ahead of us and uh, we will rise to the challenge. I have no doubt at all. But it's also we need to expect that it's going to be um, tough. And that's, you know, that's, that's part of the bargain of life. Right. So there you go. Um, so I guess that's all I have to say. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy, definitely the best thing it can buy right now is financial freedom. <laughs>